Welcome to EJB Talks, Rutgers Blaustein School experts in policy, planning, and health, where we talk with our faculty and staff experts, as well as students, about how the fields of public policy, urban planning, public health, health administration, and public and urban informatics affect your lives. Welcome to EJB Talks. I'm Stuart Shapiro, the Interim Dean of the Blaustein School, and the purpose of this podcast is to highlight the work my colleagues and our alumni in the fields of policy, planning, health, and today, informatics, are doing. We're spending this, our eighth season, speaking with new faculty at the Blaustein School. We hired 10 people in the past year in a wide array of fields, as the season will show. Today we're cheating a little bit and speaking to someone who was hired a little bit more than a year ago, uh, the director of our public informatics program, Professor Jim Samuel. Welcome to the podcast, Jim. Good morning, Stuart. So let's start sort of with a question about you and your background, your origin. How did you get interested in questions around big data and AI? That's been a very interesting journey. So my past is quite eclectic. I started off as an architect and then decided to delve into the world of business and finance. And it was while working with uh, one of the top 12 banks in the world that I began to realize the growing emphasis on data and the whole power of data and the use of technology to manage data. Uh, Those were the days just post my MBA, I was working with Excel models And then I just, one day, the realization dawned on me, this was before the financial crisis, global financial crisis, 2007, 2008, that uh, the kind of data that we're dealing with, it goes way beyond the kind of technologies that I was using at that time. It goes way beyond Excel modeling. Uh, So that's when I began to actually take a deeper look at what is the big data phenomenon all about. And the more I studied it, the more I was attracted to it, drawn into it, and it opened up a whole new world for me. So that that was the kind of the starting point of my uh, uh, journey in the world of informatics and artificial intelligence. And very soon, I also realized once I did a deep dive into the world of big data, that the future does not just belong to large quantities of data, but it belongs to high quality data coupled with algorithmic technologies that we're, that we're kind of beginning to call as artificial intelligence, artificial intelligences, so on and so forth. <laughs> gotcha. That's great. I mean, I've been fascinated with those issues too, but I never really moved beyond Excel. So um, I'm still stuck there. Um, so I'm glad you, we have you with us. Um, so you joined us as the first permanent director of our public informatics program. And Public informatics is not a common field. It's not a common degree. I'm interested to sort of get your perspective on what, and when you're talking to students who might be interested in the degree, what is public informatics? I'm going to to set the stage with a couple of thoughts and then answer the question, what is public informatics? Fair fair enough. So the, the, the initial data science became quite popular. And the idea in data science is that you are, it teaches you methods on how to work with data. Then we had the whole idea of analytics and business analytics. And uh, again, the idea was working methods to work with data, going beyond traditional data sets, traditional statistics, working with new types and varieties of data and using new forms of data visualization to discover insights, so on and so forth. And then we have uh, informatics, which the while there is a lot of overlap between statistics, data science, analytics, and informatics, each of these words, they represent some unique value. They can, you know, they reflect some unique value. So informatics refers to not just analytics, not just the use of statistics and data science methods, but also domain specialization. So usually informatics is associated with some words such as health informatics, where the implication is we are working with healthcare data and advanced methods 
to discover insights which will help us take appropriate decisions in the healthcare domain. So informatics, uh, uh, therefore, refers to the next step, going beyond data science, going a little bit beyond analytics, getting domain specialization in some sense, a higher use of technologies and technological capabilities to manage big data and smart data. And that brings us to public informatics, where we are taking this whole concept of using statistics, data science, analytics, and specializing in domains which are of public interest. So while traditional healthcare informatics relates to, could, could even be used by private hospitals, for example, when we speak about healthcare from a public interest perspective, then we are talking about public health issues. It could be public it could be public finance, it could be public education. Uh, it, I, uh, just a few days ago, I asked ChatGPT this question. I asked it a number of times in different ways, so I got a lot of output. But the first thing that it listed to the first question, uh, and that struck me as interesting, is the analysis of social media data to understand public opinion. Oh, that's interesting. And I thought I, I thought I found that quite interesting, and I agree. I agree with that thought process because those social media data was initially used for a wide variety of purposes, including business analytics. But really, social media data reflects public opinion. And so when we analyze that with the intention of mining public opinion on a topic of public interest, such as public response to COVID-19, uh, one of the early papers I wrote, one of my research uh, studies showed that initially social media showed that people were actually joking about COVID-19. Uh, they, they were being humorous. Right. They were equating it to beer. They were downplaying the risks. And then somewhere around February, towards the end of February or, and, and March of 2020, we find that humor changed to seriousness and seriousness changed to fear. Right. And we actually plotted the sentiment, the fear sentiment. It was a steep increase in just a matter of two weeks. It just shifted. Fascinating. Fascinating. I remember going through those stages uh, myself there. Um, so you've been the MPI director for about uh, 18 months now, if I'm counting right. Um, and I'm wondering how your view on this new discipline, this new area has evolved in your time in the position between interacting with colleagues, interacting with students, what's changed in sort of the way you think about it, if anything? Uh, uh, that's a good question, Stuart. And uh, number one, I believe it has changed and it, it has changed a lot. So uh, for me, the past one and a half years, it's been a great learning experience. Uh, I spoke to a lot of the uh, faculty here at Blaustein and to students and I learned a lot from them, uh, from from Clint Andrews and uh, so many others who I've interacted with. Also, the students. One thing I found about Blaustein students is that they're very passionate about their work. So I had doctoral students, for example, one of them was uh, studying used EVs, electronic vehicles. She was very passionate about her work. And as I spoke to different students, I realized the number one, that the breadth of public informatics is much greater than what I had envisaged when I mm. came into the program. Uh -huh. The second thing that I realized is that the value creation potential is also far greater as I saw students apply it to projects, as I saw the ideas that were gener being generated. I'm like, if someone were to put a net present value on some of these the implementation of some of these ideas, that would be huge. So yes, it's been a steep learning curve for me. And I don't think that's surprising given the nature of the field and uh, and uh, sort of where we were when, when we got started. All right, you've already mentioned ChatGPT. So um, we would be remiss to our listeners if we didn't spend at least part of our time talking about ChatGPT and AI and such. And I know I've seen you talk about this before, but I want to start with your definition of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is essentially a set of technologies 
including the math, the stats, the programming, the hardware that goes into it, which aims to mimic human intelligence, components of human intelligence, specifically cognition and logic. So on one side, we have cognition, which means the ability to see, the ability to hear, um, and now even the ability to smell is being, uh, there's an attempt to program. Uh, so, and, and the logical side is where we are talking about finding things, uh, adding, subtraction, the mathematical operations, so on and so forth. So these new set of technologies, which are able to mimic these human intelligence capabilities is what we're calling as artificial intelligence. Generally within the field, there's an understanding that there's general artificial intelligence, which is artificial intelligence, which has integrated capabilities like human intelligence. We are very far away from developing a meaningful general artificial intelligence. What we do have are narrow artificial intelligences, which means we can, we have a computer vision application which can identify more human faces and tag them by their name than what a single human being could meaningfully remember, which means you can train the application to recognize 100 million faces while a, a, a human being would find that difficult, especially in the short period of time that, that we are able to train the AI. Yeah, well, that's and that's that, that's different, I think, than a lot of people think about. A lot of our our views of AI are formed by popular culture, right? We think about the Terminator, right. or we think right. about her, another movie uh, where the guy falls in love with a uh, with a, uh, a an artificial uh, voice, if you will. Uh, so this is this is definitely different. I want to sort of think and sort of put this together with what we talked about before with public informatics and think a little bit about what applications of AI are most likely to make a difference in public welfare, whether that be policy, urban planning, health. You can pick one or two examples in, in any field, and I think it'll be of interest to people. Sure. I'm going to kind of uh, take a minute to talk about chat GPT and then travel into this question because I think the two are connected. So chat GPT is essentially a it's it's a it's a pre-trained model. It's a generative pre-trained uh, transformer. That's the, that's the GP that's the GPT stands for. So the reason I mention that is because there are many GPTs. Chat GPT, to the best of my uh, understanding, is based on GPT three, which is a very large uh, model with uh, a significant number of parameters. I think something like one point six billion parameters or so. I have worked with text generation. It's very easy to write a program in Python and uh, you can base it on GPT-3, you can base it on some other large language model, LLMs, and it is able to generate text. Two things, one is I'm very impressed with ChatGPT. ChatGPT is very useful and I think academia and the world in general should take a more friendly and positive approach towards ChatGPT. It's very useful, it's going to be very useful. but Along with that, the caveat that we need to remember is there is no artificial intelligence which can understand human meaning the way humans do. So though ChatGPT is impressive, while we use it, we should never forget that it does not understand meaning the way humans do. It's simply producing output uh, in a very mechanical, probabilistic fashion. Uh, having said that, now that we have experienced the power of chat gpt there are there are there are there have been a number of powerful technologies that's been released over the past few years in fact according to me generative adversarial networks was a greater breakthrough than what has been illustrated through chat gpt uh, but that's just my opinion it's i'm not stating it as an objective fact uh, the, the reason i mention it is that apart from chat gpt there are a number of technologies which have crossed certain thresholds and now they're going to be very useful. There's a lot of value creation potential. So when we talk about taking these AIs and using it for public benefit, now it's a matter of ideation and establishing the appropriate policy framework so that there is a controlled release of these technologies for public benefit. Most of the AIs are currently controlled by large corporations, 
or some specialized companies such as OpenAI. For these technologies to be fully, for these technologies to realize their full potential in public service, we need these technologies to be open source. Otherwise, there are certain risks that are going to be associated with these. One is a certain class or a certain group of people controlling what these AIs do and how they interact with the people. The data that is generated from them is also controlled. Unless it becomes open source, the education process for the public is not complete. It's incomplete. And so it's like you're, you're dealing with illiterate masses. They're able to use chat GPT, but they don't know what data it's being trained right. on. We have an idea, but really we know that it's about 40 terabytes of data. We know that it's data up to 2021 approximately. So we have some metadata information about chat GPT, but we don't know what exact data it's been trained on. So we don't know objectively what the limitations are through experience and by interacting with chat GPT, we're kind of uh, reverse engineering and understanding uh, what the limitations are. And what are the implications of that? What, is, what does that mean for the way the world might be different? Uh, number one, artificial intelligence is here to stay. So this is not a technology that we're going to be able to roll back. We have to move ahead with it. Number two, unlike other technologies where the technology would be released and then the lawmakers would get to policy making and, and building the laws and we had time, the speed at which AI is progressing is very different. We cannot use the same philosophy or the same mindset to first let the technology be released, then look at what how the technology is performing and decide what the policy should be. We need to front end it, which means Policy itself has to have a strong research component where we say, okay, what kind of technologies do we anticipate being released in 2023, in 2025? And what policies can we put in place now so that companies provide appropriate guidance, uh, sorry, companies have appropriate guidance so that when they release these AIs, there's risk management, there's transparency, there's openness, and there's fairness and equity in place. Otherwise, the technology is released, laws and policies are being developed, and by the time the laws and policies are developed, that, techno that AI technology is already outdated, and they have released the next model or the next technology. Well, let's look at the flip side. You mentioned risk management. What kind of risks are we talking about? There are different categories of risks. One category of risk is control by companies or a few powerful people who control these AIs. So there is the whole idea. There's, there are a number of risks which come in that bucket of just controlling people for individual profit or some other idiosyncratic whim or fancy of, let's say, a person who owns an AI, a, a strong AI. The other category of risk is it's related to public education. It's related to really educating people about AI. I think that AI education should be mandatory uh, at different levels, in different ways, but everyone should understand the philosophy, the concept of artificial intelligence. So when an uneducated user or an uneducated public tends to use a technology like ChatGPT, if they are not trained and if they don't understand what AI is, they can set wrong expectations and they will begin to depend on these AIs more than they should. And that can lead to very dangerous scenarios. For example, in the past, it's shown that AIs have given some really terrible and life-threatening advice. Of course, those were in experimental settings, so it was used as a joke, but uh, it could happen in the real world that a future chatbot or this is uh, chat GPT is based on GPT-3. And I'm sure within the next couple of years, we're going to see other companies with come out with their own versions and variations of chat GPT. One of these uh, bots, if they get the wrong input, if they get the wrong uh, stimulus words or, or phrases, they could give out output that's completely unexpected. Even the AI, AI scientists cannot expect what the output will be like. It's 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 a it's it's an unpredictable set of words that could be thrown out by probabilistic associations. The user could misinterpret it and just think that that's correct, while actually it's very wrong, leading to wrong decisions and different kinds of crises. Right. 
fascinating. Jim, I, I could probably keep you on for an hour asking questions about this, um, but for our listeners' sake, I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, thank you so much for coming on. It has really been educational. Likewise, Stuart. My pleasure. Also, a big thank you to our team, Amy Cobb and Karen Olson. We'll see you next week with another talk from another expert at the Blaustein School. Until then, stay safe.